Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 18th, 2012. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Michael Tonsmeyer, the mad fermentationist, helps us explore the floor of the Great American Beer Festival looking for sour and funky beers. We taste some samples and talk to the brewers who made them. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. We have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook as well, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Well, thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. You know how it works. If you need to buy something on Amazon, don't go to Amazon first. Go to our website first, basicbrewing.com. Click on the Amazon.com link on our website. It will take you to Amazon and then miraculously, invisibly in the background, uh, we will get credit for a bit of whatever uh, you buy in that session. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show. And we greatly appreciate your support. We'll also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. You can find our basic brewing iPhone and Android podcast apps on the respective stores, and the Android app is also on Amazon.com. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on Stitcher as well. Got a lot of content this week. In fact, I'm going to break one of my rules and go over the one-hour mark a bit, but it will be worth your time, believe me. Andy Sparks and I met up with uh, Mike Tonsmeyer in Denver for the Great American Beer Festival. Uh, We first talked to Mike way back in 2006. So we've known him for six years, and this is the first time that we've met in person. And we had a great time visiting breweries uh, with uh, Michael Tonsmeyer and sampling beers, uh, some of which you can see on Basic Brewing Video, uh, the episode that I'm going to r- release later this week. Now, what you're going to hear, uh, a lot of what you're going to hear is advanced stuff. But if you're a beginning home brewer, stick around because you'll be able to pick up some good information too, uh, including a look into the philosophy uh, from brewers who are on the cutting edge, the way they think about their beers. And I think that was, I thought that was very enlightening. Uh, The Mad Fermentationist will take us on a tour of the Great American Beer Festival in just a moment. But first, we have a chat with the man behind the event, Mr. Charlie Papazian. Well, Charlie, this is the 31st year. What do you think? Uh, You sold out in, what, 45 minutes this year? Yeah, in July we sold out when the tickets went on sale to the public in 45 minutes. It's a long long journey between... uh, what happened this year and trying to sell tickets the, the day of and the snowstorms in the early days you know <laughs> do you remember how many came to the uh, first one about 750 800 people you know there were there are more there's what four or five times more beers here than there were people at the first one yeah <laughs> it, well saying you 750 that's not too shabby for you know a first try yeah yeah it's you know 20 breweries 40 beers 800 people that was a good event, but and it had the same energy that this year, 2012's event has. I mean, just walking into this hall every year, it's uh, you know, I never get tired of the the energy and and the enthusiasm that everybody has. The brewers are psyched to be here, and obviously the beer drinkers are just they just love to be here. They've come from far, far and close, far and near to be here. No. I- our first one that we came to was 2005, and even in that short, relatively short period of time, the diversity of beers and the diversity of breweries has grown exponentially. I think. I yeah. mean, how do you? What do you think of the way that the the craft beer scene is evolving? Oh, uh, well, I think just looking around here right now and seeing the long lines that some of these breweries weren't even on anybody's radar five years ago or seven years ago when you were first here and there were long lines in the others early days but there were always the same ones you know the the ones new glaris and uh dogfish head but now you you walk through this hall and there are long lines people really enthusiastic about some of these newer breweries that just 
they want to try what they have. And the neat thing is that you don't have to stand in a long line to get good, great beer. That's for, yeah. as you know. <laughs> yeah, if, if there's a long line on one, go go next door. There's probably some good beers that you may discover. Yeah. So what do you think is the the new trend? What's the next thing? Oh, the next thing is doubling the number of craft beers that are enjoyed this in the in, you know in America. That's the new. I mean. Every year, there are more and more people that are kind of making the decision that, you know, paying the extra, a little bit of extra money for the, uh, the exponential enjoyability of craft beers is, has value and is having a major impact, not only in this country as, as a whole, but in local communities and in regions and states. And, and these, some of the most out-of-the-way places you see breweries succeeding because people are recognizing, you know, the beer drinkers recognizing that, man, there's value in this stuff. You know, it, you know, you're from the old school of beer drinking. You're trying to find value in the least expensive beer, but that's not what the Great American Beer Festival and all these people that are that bought their tickets. How many months? July, August, September, three months ago. That's not why they're here. Yeah, and I've been following you on Twitter. You've been traveling around the world. I guess Japan was. Uh, yeah, I was recently recent. in Japan, and I'll, that was, you know, there's a craft beer movement there that's just starting to get enough momentum to make an impact on the general beer culture there. And uh, in a couple of few weeks, I'll be going to Italy to a, the Slow Food Saloni event. Um, spend the week there giving some presentations on what American craft brewers are doing. And then I'm going to Germany, to the German trade show called the Brau, and uh, visiting a lot of people that supply ingredients and equipment to uh, craft brewers, and also talking about American hops and why they're different than the rest of the world. So we may, we're seeing some influence in Germany from America, whereas... Before oh, absolutely. it was the opposite. Absolutely. You, anywhere I travel, you know, you're going to see American-style IPAs. And even in the more, even the more, most traditional of countries, is that, that concept of innovation and thinking about beer as something other than, you know, the least expensive beer or brand you can buy and trying to find what you really enjoy in life. I mean, life is too short to be spending your money on beers that you that you're not getting the maximum enjoy yeah, yeah. enjoyment out of yeah there's there's the uh, the most interesting man advertising campaign uh -huh. where he says i don't always drink beer but da -da -da -da. do you always drink beer no i don't always drink beer <laughs> I, drink, I drink wine some sometimes you know when you're in italy you just, that's something you do every once yeah, in a while but um, you know, if craft beer was more available, you bet I'd be drinking a cow <laughs> craft beer. Uh, and in Japan, drank a lot of craft beer because the people that took us around knew where to go. And there were some really good things that you can find if you know, if, if, you, have a, if you have a guide or you know Japanese. I drink sake too. That, that, was, that was a refreshing drink every yeah, once yeah, in a while. Yeah. Uh, mead. You know, I'm a mead person. You oh, know, yeah. I make mead at home. That's an interesting, you know, so, so steeped in tradition and antiquity. It's, uh, I love to dabble in that. Yeah. Well, I know you're very, very busy. I, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Charlie. Okay. Congratulations again. Catch you the next time. Well, Mike Donsmeyer, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. It's fun to be here in person for once, James. <laughs> and we had, to, we had to come here to meet up. This is uh, very exciting. Yeah. You're, you're taller in person than you are in Skype. <laughs> yeah, so we're here at the 2012 uh, Great American Beer Fest. We're at the AHA Members Only Session, which is Saturday afternoon. And uh, we're on the trail of some sour beers. Yeah, I have challenged you. You know, the, one of the challenges for me as a journalist when coming to this thing is to find a new angle each time. Yeah. Besides, oh, this is good, this is good, this is good. Uh, it seems like to me that sour beers are taking off even more than ever now. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's um, it's amazing. I think it was only about 10 years ago that the JBF introduced a sours category. And, of course, first year, La Folie from New Belgium won. 
I mean, to this day, one of the best American sour beers. The year before, it actually won in French and Belgian ales. So, I mean, it was, uh, you know, beating a much wider array of competition that first year. I think there were only about 15 entries. Um, and I checked last year, and it was something like 120 or 150 entries. It's now broken out into a whole range of categories from traditional ones to 100% Brett beers. And, um, and that's not to mention that a lot of Saisons have a little bit of a wild character, or some tartness, or some fruit beers that aren't even entered into one of the sour beer categories. So um, they get their sourness from the ingredients? Well, not necessarily. They might just add a little bit of Brett, but it's still within that traditional Saison you know, uh, style. Could have a little tartness or a little bit of funk. Uh, but not be a, a truly, a, a really acidic beer um, like many people think of when they think of Lambic or Flanders Red or, or those styles. Now, you are writing a book about American sour beers. Uh, it's still in the early stages yet, right? Uh, I mean, so it's, I've been working on it for about two years now. Uh, and Brewers Publication has been reviewing it for a while. And uh, so hopefully things are moving along quickly and I'll, I'll have sort of at least... Uh, a time frame for the release soon. So I've been talking to about 30 brewers now, all American sour beers, pretty much anyone who uh, has made a reputation, uh, Lost Abbey, Russian River, Allagash, and then a whole lot of smaller places that maybe have done a couple of sours that I found really terrific. Alpine Brewing does a sour pumpkin beer. Uh, Surly does a 100% Brett beer aged in wine barrels that's really unique. Uh, Pentagram slash was originally called Five. Um, and yeah, it's, it's amazing being out here and just seeing how many little brew pubs from all over the country are at least dabbling in sours. And it is an evolving skill or an evolving uh, category or, or the, the methods that they're using are evolving even as you're writing the book. Definitely, definitely. And uh, the sort of the range of sour beers, it's gone from being a very traditional sort of thing, people recreating Belgian styles, making Berliner Weiss from Germany, making uh, Flemish Reds. And, and turning into this really American kind of thing where, sure, some people are still recreating and they're getting better and better at, but other places like Crooked Stave are making these amazing beers that owe, owe almost nothing to the Belgian tradition or the German tradition. Uh, beers with 100% Brettanomyces, aged on unique kinds of wood with, with American fruits like blueberries, with spruce tips, dry hopped. Um, I mean, even New Belgium, one of the breweries that really started this, and, and their uh, brewmaster, Peter Buchard, is from Rodenbach, the, the famous producer of Flemish Reds. They're going all over the place and, and doing these, you know, they, La Terroir is, a, is a, a hoppy, pale, sour beer with, with Citra and Amarillo. I mean, that's the sort of thing that would drive I, a lot of tradition is crazy, but it's, it's, it's fantastic. Now, you, since you mentioned Crooked Stave, uh, we went there the other day and uh, sampled a few of their beers, uh, and we got an interview with uh, Chad Jacobson, right? Uh, first, before I play the soundbite with uh, Chad, yeah. talk about what that is. It, it's, it's not really a brewery. Yeah, you yet. Know, well, I, I legally, I guess it is probably a brewery, um, but where there are some places that might be called contract breweries that maybe give a recipe to another uh, production brewery, and they just make it to spec, and they package it, and they ferment it and they label it and they you know, send it off to the distributor. What Chad's doing is he's actually going to another brewery, he's producing the wort, and then he's transferring it back to his space where he's got barrels and stainless steel tanks and he's doing the fermentation. He's doing the, uh, the blending, the fruiting, adding spices in his own facility, packaging it himself and, and then uh, both selling it on premises at his tasting room and then uh, shipping some out to the local market. Now, do you remember the beers that we drank, and can you describe them? Sure, a little bit. Uh, the Wild Two, he does a series of beers called the Wild Wild Brett, and these are, he did his uh, master's uh, research on 100% Brettanomyces fermentations, and this is his sort of showcase of those flavors. And uh, so he does one for the Roy G. Biv, the color wheel. And so his green was really heavily hopped. Uh, we had the yellow, uh, which had turmeric and mangoes, yellow ingredients, and we have the Indigo, which is his, his newest release, which is blueberries, barrel aged, a little bit tartar than the rest, 100% brown on its own. Really, it's surprising he picks particularly fruity strains, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sourness. It doesn't make a whole lot of barnyard, farmyard, funky flavors. They can be very fruity, tropical, beautiful flavors, um, and uh, it works really well. And then in addition to that, 
He's doing beers like Surrette, which is a farmhouse uh, saisonny five grain ale with a you know oats and a couple other wheat and whatnot. Um, and we had the Surrette Reserva, which was aged in a Chardonnay barrel. I think that was your favorite, James. Yeah, yeah it was very nice. It wasn't. Uh, it, it was kind of a basic beer as far as that goes. Uh, the flavors weren't as complex as some of the others. Yeah. Uh, the way. He's even using uh, blending uh, beers with kombucha. Yeah. And that's actually surprisingly something that's not, he's not the first to do that. I know Jester King's done that. I know Dogfish Head has done that. We, um, we did it on an episode of Basic Brewing Video, by the way. <laughs> uh, and and, and on, on the radio, I sent you rare the, the, the yeah. beer kombucha. I got a lot of funny reactions on that one. You should go back and you yeah. should get a clip from that one to play. <laughs> so we can take credit. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, we're, we're standing in, would you call this a brewery? I would call it our barrel cellar. <laughs> um, and, and that's actually been really tough. I'll, I'll send texts to the guys or something like, hey, me at the brewer, the cellar tomorrow. That's <laughs> where our beers are now. Yeah. yeah, it's very much what it is. So, And that's why we're continuing more and more to call it our, our barrel cellar. So describe the operation. What are, what are we standing in? Where are we? Um, so where we are is at Crooked Stays Barrel Cellar. We're standing literally right here right now um, in our packaging and cellar area. So we've got a 15-barrel uh, bright tank, 30-barrel room for a 30-barrel bright tank that's coming in, and the 20-barrel fermenter. And that makes up our, our cellar and packaging area. Uh, we're able to primarily ferment beers in the fermenter, where we're brewing at another brewery, bringing back wort and fermenting here. Uh, but also we're brewing at another brewery, aside from that one, producing finished beer and bringing finished beer back here and being able to age it in our barrels, whether it's our saisons or some of our different bases for our sours. When those are ready, we're making blends into our bright tanks and bottling and packaging right here. So we're the second half of the brewing operation, or really the entire operation of what a winery would look like. We've got packaging equipment, we've got some of the stainless for the bright tanks, but otherwise we're, we're full of barrels and an area to condition and age barrels. How many and barrels do you have? Of, of small wine barrels, whiskey, spirit barrels, um, we're just shy of 100. I think we're around like uh, 80 or 90, 86 barrels, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But we've also got uh, four fooders. One of them's uh, 25 barrels, so that holds about, let's see, cut in half, about 12, 13 oak barrels, like wine size barrels. And then we've also got three 58 barrel fermenters, and each one of those holds just about the equivalent of 30 oak barrels worth of beer. So. If we break it down into a smaller wine barrel size, we're looking at um, uh, just about 200 oak barrels worth of beer. And does this reflect your background in wine? It does, very much so. What I was interested in in wine was the biochemistry and the aging characteristics within oak. Uh, it was something I started becoming interested in during my undergraduate degree, which is one of the reasons why I tried La Folie. I saw, I think it was like 1920, I see this barrel fermented beer instantly i'm thinking oh like red wine mm -hmm. try it was a uh, eye opener <laughs> and eventually became something i tried to drink all the time um, <laughs> but in the beginning it was uh it was a learning curve i guess it was a palate curve i guess i would call it and that was what was the most interesting to me when i was then studying winemaking in new zealand uh, you can always emphasize in different things for me it was all about the biochemistry of red wine anthocyanins and the process within polyphenols and tannins within oak so looking at the biochemistry, the reactions that take place as um, oak brings its characters into wine, wine gives its characters into the oak, and then the equilibrium that you'll have as that builds. So for me, this is a very natural progression from the studying I did with winemaking and the wines that I was looking at now into brewing. I'm very much reacting and acting like a winemaker with blends, characteristics that we're looking for in the beers. So how would you describe the beers that you're producing? What is your focus or what is your goal? What is your vision, as the corporate guys would say? Um, it's, a, it's a split vision in many ways. One is to continue certainly with the 1% Brett beers that we're producing. Uh, that's what the research that I did was on primary fermentation characteristics of Britannomyces yeast species. So continuing with that, continuing to grow what are actually um, not very wild beers, but instead kind of delicate, subtle beers, um, albeit you can do them with a little bit of citrus or with a lot of hops or blending in a certain amount of tartness. But on the other hand, um, well, well, that is, I mean, there's, there's nothing like it. It's, I guess, new age. Saison uh, and Lambic are, are very, from, I guess, a historical, traditional standpoint, are, are huge passions. They're both very similar, actually. 
Um, with Saison, you were using fresh hops from the harvest. With Lambic, you're using aged harvests, aged hops from previous harvests. Lambic was spontaneous, and Saison used a culture. But other than that, you have two beers that are actually very, very similar, very similar mind frame. Saison brewers often bought Lambic to blend in. They then often dry hopped their beer. They called it um, uh, relivening aged beer or relivening old beer, so to bring hops into it. This is, you know, not far off from what the Brits were doing as they were shipping IPA and pale ales over to India. It's, you know, keeping the hops for preservatives, and that's why Saison was so hoppy. And so a lot of this information comes from historical information, different research. So we have those that kind of build this base. I'm really trying to produce a, a passion-driven 19th century Saison, but at the same time American sours. So really what, what Crooked Stave stands for is what I call sort of a, a wild category of beers. So we're producing these 100% Britannomyces beers that are subtle, delicate. I would say some Belgian beers are even more aggressive than these are in many ways, more phenolics, whereas some of our Brett beers are more earthy, citrus, tropical fruit. But then uh, American Sours, where we've got a 9% Baltic Porter that ages in third-use bourbon barrels uh, just to get those nuances of the vanillins and that very lactic, um, well-rounded, kind of blended character. So it's, uh, it's a, transgression, a transgression, really, into uh, an age of beer that's different. It's not ale, it's not lager, they're wild, as I see them. Yeah, I mean... They- if you were to, do you have any beers entered in the in the GABF and the in the in the competition this year? I mean, it, it's it, it's hard to put those into anything but what category twenty three. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 even but, yeah. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, we do. We have five beers entered in, um, and and that's one of the neat things about the competitions is that as beer continues to evolve, uh, we stick a style to it. And there is a home for it. So I used to joke around that uh, the Brewers Association made the American-style bread ale so I could enter competitions. Um, So we've got a beer. we certainly got a beer entered into that. Uh, We produce a very traditional Saison, and so that's entered into Belgian and French-style Saisons. Our Petite Sour is a hybrid of farmhouse beers, but very much flavors that we associate with like a Lipsegger Goza, almost Berliner Weiss, Lipsegger Goza, farmhouse-type beer. So... That's entered in as a, a Lipsiger Goza um, German Sour. We have two beers in the wood and barrel age, so Sentience, which is our wild quad. So a good amount of tart kind of city into it, big bourbon and, and cognac type characteristics. Uh, same thing, wooden barrel age beer, Persica, it's a golden peach sour, so that's fruited wooden barrel age beer. It's got some of that Chardonnay oak characteristic in it. So we were able to find categories that... Um, are open to interpretation. Mm. Uh, judging at GABF is very unique where the beers are judged on how you describe them and then how they fit into the category you put them into. So you certainly can find the places to fit the beers with the right descriptions into them. And if you hit the mark where you're at, any beer on any given day can do really well. So, But, you, but you're essentially just... M- how do you how do you go about constructing a beer? Let me ask that. I mean, because you don't... You're not shooting for a... a pigeonhole or you're not shooting for a style you're not shooting for something like a porter or a a pale ale you're not shooting how do you come up with each beer inspirations can come from a lot of different places so for instance we do have a beer called nightmare on brett i love baltic porters so i brewed um, a baltic porter but using you know what i know about the raw materials for fermenting with Britannomyces and primary fermented with Britannomyces and then it went into spirit barrels. So there is kind of, okay, let's put our spin on a, on a Baltic Porter, a beer that I just love to be able to drink. But at the same time, with the blending and the different beers, um, they're driven by a sort of an end process. Uh, Deconstruction is the best way to explain it, where you, you see the beer, you hold a glass in your hand, see the beer in it, see the type of head you want, the color you want, smell it, taste it, and then set out to create that. As a brewer, you understand which materials will get you to that color, will get you to that flavor, will get you to that alcohol, will get you any other sort of ingredients that you need to add into it to get to where you want. Does it have a big hop profile? What kind of hop profile are you tasting? Then you go back and think, well, you know, I know from using Centennial and Amarillo before that that works. Or these new New Zealand or Australia hops will get me this tropical fruit flavor that's going to go really well with this yeast, and that's what I'm smelling in this beer. So that's a big part of it is take the final product, work backwards, and then 
you still possibly have something different in the end and then how do you get to where you want it to be or how do you let the beer speak for itself as what it is and appreciate it for that uh, there's a lot of ways of looking at it some of that's a little bit more wine like winemakers will understand their grapes that they're harvesting they'll understand what's coming in they understand their process there's a lot of ways to make a merlot or there's a lot of ways to make a riesling different levels of acidity how it ferments and that's going to be based on the vineyards that it came from the winemaker knowing his land and knowing how to produce the wine it's very much the character that we kind of embrace here at crooked stave with our beers now you're, you're almost more of a chef than a brewer would you say i mean you're working with different ingredients you're, you're working for you know with spices and and you you are creating uh a concoction that is that is more of a food item sort of than a traditional beer and particularly that wild wild bright yellow that we had with the turmeric and the mangoes and i mean it's it's a beautiful beer and it's got all those characteristics sort of tied together with that brett primary fermentation that both compliments and then i mean you obviously know the science almost better than anyone of what brett can take with the compounds in those spices and in those hops and and create new flavors uh experimentation is fun uh yeah being kind of chef like it's it's one of the things that actually really drives a lot of my influences. Uh, as I've done more with Crooked Save, we've actually gotten a lot closer with a lot of chefs and worked with them, and they very much inspire me. I always have kind of been inspired by what I considered the culinary revolution that kind of went on in America, and I think that we're still seeing. We drew influences from other countries. We brought in French cuisine, Italian cuisine, uh, Ethiopian, Indian, and we've made these new age, different things. You see chefs breaking stuff down, breaking down comfort food, doing different things, experimenting. It's very much what's going on right now in brewing. And so for me, I draw inspiration from seeing that. I draw inspiration from the travels, the different indigenous food, different places that I've been, different ingredients, and just <clears throat> unique ways of looking at brewing, just like they were looking at unique ways of cooking, thinking outside of the box. Well, in every, in every industry, you should be ready to do that. You should be ready to kind of embrace those changes. And that's what's going on in brewing. There's lots of us being able to do it. And so everyone kind of building together. Um, as I've hung out with more of the chef friends and stuff that we've got here in Denver, they're just like brewers. They're talking about their friend in New York who they've got. Oh, do you know so-and-so? Or, oh, yeah, from the French Laundry. He was just in at Frosca cooking. Oh, you're going to go to that dinner? Oh, no, I missed it because of this. I mean, they're just like us brewers where we're trying to go visit our friends when Deschutes is in and they've got a barrel aging thing going on like I'm there I'm going to see that or someone else in town or festivals and and it's neat to see that that camaraderie they have it's a camaraderie that we have as well they travel around as well and go to each other's restaurants and cook with each other uh, so that's something that we embrace here in brewing and therefore I embrace the use of ingredients in a similar way a chef would as well to make a marriage so most of our listeners are, are either home brewers or about to be home brewers. Uh, I, I don't want to get into the specifics of, you know, the science of what you're doing, but what, what piece of advice would you give them? There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> One is keep experimenting. Uh, home brewers are at the forefront of a lot of really amazing things. Breweries sometimes get a little tied up in the fact that they might have to make that IPA or that wheat beer or keep these things going because they're a business. Um, Homebrewing is a passion and a skill and something that you get to do that you can add the Tabasco spice into it or these different things. And while it might not interest someone else, you know, it interests you to do it. So keep experimentation up. Experimentation is awesome. Believe it or not, it actually does inspire brewers as they continue to go. They hear about these different things, and sometimes it reminds them of that mentality that they know that they should embrace with the brewery as they continue to grow, or as the breweries, I guess, continue to grow from where the home brewers were. So experimentation is great. And the other is... Um, uh, something I heard a while back before I got into to brewing, and it was um, KISS, you know, keep it simple, stupid. And the truth is, I think too often um, homebrewers do try to complicate things in recipes. You know, some of the best recipes have like two, three malts in them. You can brew everything from a Pilsner to a Saison, you know, a porter. In a porter, you don't have to have every single malt. It doesn't need to be a malt soup. And a lot of homebrewers probably right now who listen to this are saying, yeah, I know, and, and they get it. But that's the one thing. Remember, it only takes a little bit of, you know, dehusk carafa too to get that color in. And that's the difference sometimes between your pale ale and your porter. So, so keep it simple. 
um, don't make it a malt soup. I'd say that's one of my biggest things. We we joke around sometimes. We look at people's recipe, and you see a recipe with like ten different malts in it, and and the running joke is, Look, looks like a homebrew recipe, because <laughs> you can as a home brewer. That's yeah, part of experimenting. Yeah. It's part of being able to do it. It's mm-hmm. a five barrel batch. Let's see this. But actually, you'll learn much more about brewing when you keep it simple. So just have a base. I keep a pretty similar base for every single beer that I brew. Certain amount of two row, usually making up sixty to eighty percent of the base beer is two row. I really like somewhere around two percent, or sorry, ten percent of a Munich. Mm. And you know, I tend to not use wheat. Um, I like spelt because we're doing Britannomyces beer, so I like spelt or oats. Oats are really big for me to create a creaminess. But otherwise, I only bring in you know a couple of percentage points of the other malts, and I can see their influence or not. And that will make that's how you create a. I guess become a better brewer and understand your ingredients. Awesome. I know you're super busy. I appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, you guys. It's great to be with you. Um, no, but what's fantastic about being at the JBF is uh, James and I are staying here on the floor drinking a sour beer from Natty Greens, which is a little brew pub in North Carolina. You know, that's not where people were making sour beers 10 right, years ago or right. even five years ago. Right. And this is pretty good. Yeah, it is very good. It's, um, I think it's vaguely Flemish style. It's had aged about two years in oak with both bacteria and Britannomyces. Um, it's got a little bit of sweetness left. It's not too dry. It's not too funky. It's It's got a nice sort of whiny, fruity, uh, red fruit, maybe cherry sort of flavor. Yeah, it's a, and again, it smells, and I, and I may say this a lot, but it smells like a La Folie because it's sour and it's got yeah. the wood in there. Uh, but it's nicely balanced. It's it's more drinkable than La Folie, yeah. I think. No, it's, the, the sourness is a lot softer than La Folie. I, honestly, I, I probably like Lafayette a little bit better than this, but this is if you're a brew pub and you're not known for sour beers and you've got regular customers coming in and you want to introduce them to something, and this isn't dumbed down. This is still a complex beer, but it's more approachable. Right, right. So now we're at the we're at the bottom of this. Oh, and one thing I wanted to, uh, before we get too far away from Crooked Stave, yep. one thing I wanted to, uh, to follow up on is that in the tasting room, mm-hmm. it was filled with young beer drinkers. Yep. No, I mean, I, I think everyone sort of gravitates to the sort of beers that they had when they were first getting into it. I think a lot of the, uh, the people who have been drinking craft beer since, say, the 1980s tend to gravitate more towards the Reinheitsgebot. Um, you know, they don't want weird stuff in their beer. They don't want it barrel-aged this or imperial that. They want, you know, pale ales and German pilsners, and they want two style, and they want it clean, and they want well done. I think younger beer drinkers are more willing to roll the dice. Yep. They're, they're willing to take a little bit of a risk and go out there and try some. I mean, there are a lot of beers out here. I, I had a beer last night that tasted like Reese's Peanut Butter Cup cereal. <laughs> I mean, I, that's exactly what I said. And intentional or not, but it was a peanut butter chocolate stout. And that's something I think a lot of people would say, not for me. And honestly, an ounce was probably about enough of it. Yeah. Um, but it was fun to try. And this is sort of event. If I drink too many pilsners, they all run together. Yeah. This isn't. Yeah. It's not conducive to going from a double IPA to imperial stout to a sour. The pilsners, not you're not going to taste it. So shall we seek out another uh, funky wild beer? Definitely. Um, we could jump into the uh, the brew pub pavil- pavilion if it's not too crazy. Okay, we'll be right back. We're standing here at the Trinity Brewing Company from Colorado Springs, Colorado, booth, and we are trying the Le Capitaine, which is, uh, it says all saisons on the sign, and this one apparently is, what was it, 19% alcohol? 12, 12. 12%. (laughs) That would be a hell of a saison. (laughs) I've had had a few one-ounce samples already. What do you think of this beer? I mean, it's, it's really great. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much uh, Britannomyces and Funk covers up that really harsh alcohol you'd yeah. expect in a 12% beer. But it's funky. I mean, really, it's, it's a, um, you know, earthy, barnyardy. It's got some citrus in there, too. Really complex beer. Yeah, this is more challenging than the first beer we had. Yeah, certainly. And, I mean, that's not surprising. Colorado has a lot more beer drinkers, a lot deeper beer culture. That's true. And we are in the, the brew pub pavilion, pavilion here. So these are all, we're surrounded by brew pubs. Uh, and the, uh, maybe we can sneak in to talk to the, uh, to talk to the brewer. You must be Jason. I am. Michael Tonsmeyer, James Spencer. Basic Brewing Radio. Um, I actually attempted to email you at some point. I'm working on a book on American sour beers. 
Uh -huh. uh, I'm a really big fan of your beers. Oh, thank you, bro. Um, tell, tell us about Le Capitan. Le Capitan? Um, that's an ode to Peter Buchart beer. So the head brewer from uh, New Belgium, who used to be from Rodenbach. What we did on that beer was uh, we, we used ingredients all that he had used in beers in his past. Um, so it's got a whole lot of pumpkin. It's got Buddha's hand in it. It's got candied endive in it. It's got, um, let's see, uh, it's fermented with Britannomyces um, and one Saison yeast aged on Chardonnay barrels with cocoa nibs and also um, fermented with, uh, did I say Britannomyces? I think I did. But yeah, um, that's that's what that beer is. It's 12% Saison, so it's big. It's it's huge, um, but it's very, very drinkable. So. It seems like you're very much sort of in the phantom mold. The, you know, Saison is this very wide, broad, dry, but complex, but could be in any direction. Definitely. Um, the way that I view uh, uh, Saison is very much like Danny Prignan at um, Phantom. And... Uh, the way I look at it is you can use pretty much any idea, um, but no ingredient should overwhelm another. So they should all agree and not be like IPA level as far as like hops goes. Um, so it's all about just making a very delicate beer. And I think it takes a really delicate hand and paying a lot of attention to your recipes to do it. Um, and what's also nice is our, uh, our farmhouse series, um, we brew 40 different saisons plus in a year just on the farmhouse series. And so um, all of our saisons are done with some Breda in the fermentation. Um, usually a couple different saison yeast too, sometimes a farmhouse yeast. Uh, but the farmhouse series, uh, it, to me personally, is my favorite beer that we do at Trinity. And um, what we do is we, we really brought, brought it back to the roots of Belgium and we get a fresh harvested ingredients every time we brew it. So that's why it, it, it's constantly changing and adapting. It goes from- a Seasonal idea to brewing. Extremely seasonal, but also going back to the roots of what Saison is, just grabbing whatever you can and making a beer with it, so. That's, that's the amazing thing about the La Capta. I mean, you named all those ingredients, but really all it tastes like is is funk and citrus and yeah. balance. Yeah, exactly. You know, things, as you said, nothing overwhelms the overall character. What, what I see on that beer, too, is if you drink a full glass, you can tell just a very slight ri rise of chocolate, like bitterness right at the very end of your glass. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really nice beer. And that was a hard one to make. But uh, it's, it's pretty cool, too. I don't know if you've ever seen the... Uh, um, ad that New Belgium did with Peter in a suit and his hat was floating and it said follow your folly well that's kind of our character of Peter on the front of it you know so there's an owl sitting in the tree with a, with a hat hovering above very, very nice cool. and so I, I remember reading that you do use so it's not the same Saison blend of, of yeast and breath that you pitch into everything it, you sort of change it based on what character you want in the beer exactly and then also um you know, since it's a blended fermentation and then we'll recrop from, you know, a blended yeast fermentation, it'll just change on its own too, which I think is really cool. I mean, part of being a Saison brewer is embracing, you know, the beer itself and like allowing the beer to become what it is. So um, a lot of brewers are all about control and precision, you know, and I'm all about, well, choose good things, put them into the beer and then, you know, let the beer have its own kind of attitude or personality, you know, it, it's... It's not important to me to have the exact yeast flavor every single time I brew a beer. So I, I think it's actually more interesting if it does change and adapt. So this, this is a home brewing podcast. So for home brewers, there's no reason to try to hit the exact same tiny target every time. Embrace that variability. Embrace what the yeast is giving you. Maybe change the spicing depending on what direction it's going in. Or I, I would really recommend, yeah, um, if, if you're doing Belgian style brewing, that's uh, I, I would encourage it. If, but if you're if you're a home brewer that has like a very temperature controlled system for like loggers, you obviously have to be pretty precise to make a, a pilsner. You know, um, what, one thing that I do like about saisons now that you bring up uh, the, the entire um, home brewing side of it is we don't put temperature control on any of our saison fermentations at all. Um, I have saison fermentations that go all the way up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I think we just had one that went up to 118. 
Um, so I mean, so, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy, and it's so hot that when you touch the tank, it's the tank is literally hot, you know. Um, but the great thing about it is a lot of homebrewers don't have temperature, you know, control capabilities. So it's an awesome style for homebrewers to do. So. Do you have a, a Saison yeast strain that you really prefer, like for those higher temperatures, or do any of them not do well at that that high temperature? I, I've never had problems with temperatures, to be honest with you. Everything has seemed to work so far. Um, a lot of people like uh, the Dupont strains, 565, 566, but I think they go a little bit too fruity. I like my saisons more dry, more peppery. Um, so I use a blend of. 37, 26, 37, 11 as my base plan. Uh, it is a, let's see, 37, 26 is a, it's a Saison strain, but it's a French Saison strain. And then 37, 11 is a farmhouse strain. And then uh, most of them, I use uh, Dre Fontaine for Tenomyces in at about 25% or sometimes higher. So, yeah. Yep. Throw them high, finish them low, you know. Um, any, even with high degree Play-Doh beers, I think you have to say, uh, finish Saison at like below 1.5 Play-Doh. Yeah. So that's, to me, that's about the only definition of Saison is dry. Dry, yep, drinkable, yeah. light body, you know. So um, the things that I like about that, man, it's just like even it's, if it's a big strong beer like that Capitan that you just tried, it's it's not it's, it's not cumbersome, yeah. you know. So You don't feel like you're drinking a barley wine or anything like that. I mean, it's... Honestly, I had this last night, and I would have guessed it was 7 or 8%, something like that. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. But, yeah, it went all the way up to 12, so. Yeah. Wow. Terrific. Cool. Thank you very yeah. much. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. From Trinity Brewing Company in Colorado Springs, that's Jason Yesters. So this is uh, Cambridge Brewing Company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they have a beer called... Cerise Casse, which is a Solera beer, and I think Will uh, Will Myers, the brewer, is the first brewer in the country to do a true Solera. So um, I guess we can push over the side here. We're moving around. Um, and so this is aged in a series of barrels, and the younger barrels, so when the oldest barrels are ready to bottle, he uh, pulls out of them, or ready to keg, I should say, ready to package. Get pulled out of the older barrels, packaged, beer from a younger set of barrels goes into the older barrels to refill them, and then fresh beer goes in the young barrels. And so it's uh, it's how sherries and uh, some uh, sherry, uh, some vinegars and ports are made. Balsamic vinegar. Tasting what sort of uh, aromas are you getting out of this one, James? I'm getting some chocolate. Is it just me? It does. It has a little uh, white roast to it. I mean, it's um, sort of an amberish brown color, I'd say. It has some cherries in there, too. Yeah, there's, there's some sourness on the nose, but there is a, also a darker component in there yes, as well that no, I'm associating much. with chocolate. Yeah. Maybe chocolate-covered cherries. And, and this, uh, unlike the, the Natty Green Sour we tried earlier, this has a sharper acidity. Really wow. bright, popping. Wow. That is a sour beer. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, oh, and Will's gone on the phone. Oh. <laughs> um, I wonder if we can sneak around the back and uh, get his attention. <laughs> Will Myers from Cambridge Brewing Company. Welcome. What are we trying here? Uh, we're trying a really interesting little beer called Ceris Casse. And uh, it's a beer that I've been brewing consistently for nine years now in uh, what I believe is the first Solera system used for beer in the United States. Um, so uh, Solera system essentially is a, a series of barrels used for aging and in this case for uh, microbial re-fermentations over time. The system at its, at its most basic description is a set or a level of barrels. The oldest ones are never emptied entirely, and it's from those oldest barrels that will pull out a fraction each year to blend together to create that year's expression of the beer. The empty fractions are then topped up by the next oldest set of barrels, and then that, of course, leaves fractional displacement in those next oldest ones. So the third tier, the youngest barrels, top up the middle barrels. At that point, we brew the same beer to the same recipe. We make that work, put it into the youngest barrels, which spontaneously re-ferments from the resident microflora. So everything's always being blended forward. And every time that you drink the Cerise Casse, 
every year that it's released, that expression contains a proportion of every batch of that beer that's ever been made between one and nine years old. So we're not taking one-year-old barrels and nine-year-old barrels and seven-year-old barrels and blending them together. It's kind of a, a constant feed or a constant topping up situation. So it was originally developed by uh, the producers of Sherry in Jerez, Spain, uh, to create a complex and mature wine without having to put all of your wine at once into barrels for 10 years and then hoping that it worked out. So from that point of view, it was meant to, uh, to create in an expedient manner a, a mature complex drink. In our case, we're using it uh, more just for the expression of flora and age and subtle intended oxidation through oxygen uptake through the barrels. So it's a pretty neat little monster. Yeah, no kidding. It, it would seem to me that, uh, or how, let me ask the question, how does the finished beer change over time? Uh, well, it's changed significantly over time. We had a few years in a row uh, over the uh, last two, three years where it's gotten very, very aggressively tart. Uh, and because the barrels haven't been uh, emptied, as I'd anticipated would one day be the case, we also started experiencing some autolytic characters, some, some dead yeast issues. Uh, so we did a year and a half ago, immediately after I wrote about an article uh, about Soleros on an article for the New Brewer, actually have to remove all of the beer from the barrels. We had to bring in more wood, pump it. The, the reason that I had to remove it all was because I had uh, stupidly started growing my Solera by having a set of barrels and then putting younger barrels on top of them and younger barrels on top of that. Because my impression of a Solera was that it was a vertical system, although that's rarely technically the case in cherry production. But when those oldest barrels started to show some off characteristics or go too aggressively acidic and acetic, I had to actually break down the entire system top to bottom. So I had to bring in new wood, take the youngest barrels out, pump them off, move them off to the side, get them upstairs, clean them, get them bound into the barrel cellar, take the medium set, the middle set of the Criadera, pump that into those, then find another set of barrels for the Solera, which is not only the system, but the oldest set of barrels. I had to pump that up into the tanks to make our, our blend for the year using the entire batch of all of the barrels. Then I had to get those barrels upstairs, wash them out, clean them thoroughly, get them back downstairs and then rearrange the set so that as needed we can remove flights and sections and then had to basically backfill out of that that master tank of that year's expression into the oldest barrels so it's a it's a pain in the ass i was going to say is this, this is uh the the newest release i guess that was no, after this the is, cleaning out. this is actually well this is post cleaning but this is a 2011 expression okay. I, I have this, not this done is a 2012. Bit more oak than I remember tasting in the past, and maybe it's just. Yeah, I think that's because yeah. the uh, the youngest set, which got blended forward yeah. to top up uh, afterwards, picked up a, a lot of oak because they were fresh wine barrels. It's really nice. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, as I was saying before, I was get, uh, getting some kind of dark chocolatey notes in there, along yep. with the sourness as well. Some of that I think comes from the cherry fruit that goes through a barrel refermentation. But I think some of that chocolatey note also came from the, uh, the the French oak barrels that we had that were medium plus to, to plus plus in toast. Now, if you were to continue the system without having to revamp it and reconstruct it, does the wood character diminish over time? Because oh, you're absolutely. Because the barrels, uh, are, are especially in the eldest set, the, Cre the Solera system, are very, very neutral by this point. When I bought them, they were already neutral at five or six years old from the winery. Although that first year, we did still pick up a fair amount of, of oak and tannin and vanillin. Uh, at this point, they're, they are nothing but a home for bugs and beer. <laughs> so they're essentially wooden uh, uh, stainless steel tanks. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, they, they still let a little bit of oxygen in, and that's... Uh, oh, yeah, indeed. And, and as you know, the, those microorganisms need that, that oxidation, you know. When, when Pediococcus takes over and it goes through that ropey re-fermentation, which generally happens in this beer around the, the five or six month mark, you know, there's, there's a lot of diacetyl put off by that. Uh, the Botanomyces, which, which is an aerobic yeast, uh, you know, needs that, that subtle oxygen infusion in order to, to uptake all of that diacetyl and clean the beer back out again. 
So it's important. I mean, it would not be the same beer if it were in stainless steel for up to nine years and we just had one tank that we were blending in and out of. And you were just saying oak chips or oak cubes or oak, sp oak spirals for that oak flavor. You That's could, not the only thing. But the beer is not supposed to ultimately have oak exactly. flavor. Exactly. The fact that it does is, is nice, but it's incidental. Yeah. yeah. When, and that's exactly, the, the oak is more for the oxygen permeability than the oak itself. Correct. Or the, the oak flavor, the vanillin, or whatever compounds you're actually getting out right. of it. Exactly. Now, the first sip that I took, it nearly knocked me over because it's so tart. Uh, but now that I've taken, you know, now that I'm almost down to the bottom of this one ounce, it's uh, it's delicious. Uh, I mean, it, I love sour beer, yeah. so it was delicious. It, it does beginning. have a lot of very aggressive acids. Yeah. But... Your, your palate acclimates to acidity right. very, very quickly. Right. Right. So it's definitely a second sip beer. Right. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Very, very well done. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Nice talking to you. <laughs> I'm Christopher McGarvey from uh, Front Street Brewery in Wilmington, North Carolina, and we're looking at the, uh, the winning list of all the uh, award-winning breweries here. We're trying to find the sour beer winners today. And so the yeah. sours initially were just uh, about 10 years ago, only one category was just sour ales. And now they're broken down into um, more specific ones. So we've got the Belgian style Lambic or sour ales. Uh, and we've got, oh, uh, uh, Captain Lawrence Barrel Select is on there. It's a brown ale. I'm a big fan of that one. I've got a bottle at home still. They, they cleaned up in a few different categories. Oh, did they? Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of Captain yeah. Lawrence. Uh, the winner on that was the Upland Brewing Co. Sour Reserve. They do. Uh, Caleb does a lot of sour beers there. They uh, he actually wrote an article about him in New Brewer a couple years ago. They use uh, very similar to the Y yeast mash in uh, this featured in Wild Brews. It's sort of like a cereal mash. You boil the wheat and then you add it to the main mash to raise the temperature, and then you sparge with really hot water. At least that's what they do for their fruit lambics. I don't know about the sour reserve. I, I would bet some more. And then uh, the brewery uh, Sans Pagier, which I believe is, uh, has grapes in it. I know that was on, and we might be able to go find that in a little bit if it's not gone already. And then there were quite a few in the uh, sort of the new hybrid style categories. Uh, American style sour. There's Captain Lawrence again awesome. with the Gold Barrel Select. I think that, was that one aged in? Uh, so this is Barrel Select Gold, won the gold. Uh -huh. And so I, I don't know the story behind that beer. I know they did a barrel select black. The regular barrel select is a brown. Um, Lost Abbey. Lost Abbey, of course, Red Poppy, the, the beautiful Flemish oh, Red Inspires. Me, uh, cherry uh, sour beer they do. Yeah, that's so a wonderful beer. We're blocking beer. the way for people to get into one. Why don't we, why don't we head over to Front Street Brewing and hang out? <laughs> might, we might take a break from the sour to taste your, uh, your raspberry wheat beer. Why don't we do that? We're going to do the, the uh, raspberry wheat at uh, the Riptide uh, raspberry wheat here at Front Street from Wilmington, North Carolina. So this is just a. Is there, wait a minute. We have to be very close. Tell me about this. Tell me about this beer. Uh, so we're drinking the Riptide raspberry wheat from Front Street Brewery. It's a very straightforward American wheat ale to which we add raspberry juice after fermentation. There's so many fruit beers out there. We're trying to create something. Uh, that's not just a beer brewed for you know the drinker, the, the beer drinker's girlfriend that who who won't drink a beer, uh, or boyfriend. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we wanted to have a nice fresh fruitiness, but not too sweet. You know, and uh, we're right next to a marine base. We we uh, you know we know that it's manly enough for the, the marines to drink, <laughs> so we're happy with that. Yeah, it's very nice. It's nicely balanced. I think There's, it doesn't slap you in the face yeah. with the raspberries. So, no, it, it is. It's got um, good fruit flavor, and, and it's nice and dry. I mean, sometimes fruit beers have that real... Yeah, exactly. We're, we're yeah. trying to keep it from being being a fru-fru, wine-cooler, sweet drink, you know. Uh, but we want, we're want we in a very hot coastal town on the beach, and uh, we want people to be able to have more than just one pint uh, and, and not feel like they're getting tired out or, or weighed down by it. Yeah, so. yeah very nice. Yeah. Yeah, so there's actually a couple of beers uh, on here that I'm not sure we tried necessarily, but that we talked to the brewers. Uh, Jason Yester over at uh, Trinity Brewing won a bronze for American-style Brett Ales with TPS Report. I know that won a gold a couple of years ago. I believe there's roses in it, among other things. And then uh, there's another one on here. Uh, you always have to give your cover sheet with your TPS Report. And they have O-Face, too. They, they have... <laughs> It's amazing a brewery that has two office uh, 
Office space. Office space <laughs> reference <laughs> beers. Uh, and then Crooked Save won a silver for Sentience, which I believe is a barrel-aged quad with, I, I'm sure, 100% bread, although I'm not positive uh, on that. I had that the other night uh, over there at, uh, at Crooked Stave, and, uh, you know, it's very complex, um, just really rich. I mean, hard to describe. It's like such a weird flavor. I don't even know if I have the words for it yet, you know? Yeah, that's <laughs> the thing is that those beers at Crooked Stave, they don't fit in any category, they're, they're, right? They're, so they, so your your mind is searching for descriptors because you've never had that before. They're they're completely uh, original, you know, uh, experimental beers over there, and I think He's that's really really exciting yeah. to see. It's sort of a mad scientist, you yeah, know? and an art, <laughs> and an artist as well. Yeah. Well, uh, we appreciate your time. Oh, thank Thanks you. for yeah. the beer. I and just we showed up with the list at the right time. <laughs> yeah. Let's go find some uh, some. Uh, Weird beers. Yeah, are you are you hunting sours? Here? Yeah, exactly. I, I wanted to do a little of that. If you don't mind if I just Come follow behind. Tag, tag along. Yeah. Okay, we're down to uh, the brewery in Anaheim, California. Everybody, uh, you know, it's not spelled the American way. It's uh, or the English way. It's uh, well, it's, it's it's actually spelled the Patrick Rue R U E is the owner, and so it's B R U E R Y with his name stuck in the middle. I mean, if you like uh, if you like interesting beers, you probably already know. So, but what are exactly. we drinking? This is I, I don't know the correct pronunciation. It's Saint Paget, uh, and it just won them a third place medal for a sour. I believe this has a little bit of grape to it, a little bit of wine grape. It's um, a very subtle flavor, though. It's not big. You know, you might not even know it was a fruit beer first. You might just think it was wine barrel aged, or it was um, a fruitier strain of bread or something. It's really well balanced. Um, it's again one of these beers that's tart but not really sharp. It's a very yeah. soft. It's a softer sourness, right? Um, which which can be nice, but I mean sometimes it's nice to have a little bit more uh, punch to it. Um, it's a nice complex use of fruit. It's not the fruit's not overwhelming it. You still get uh, some of the oak and some of the uh, wild fermentation. And is it my imagination, or am I uh, tasting spice in there as well? You know, I don't know. I mean, it certainly could be, but it could be the. You know, the spice from the oak or the spice from the bread. Um, this is one of those beers that I, I don't know the full story behind. Uh, sometimes it's fun to taste something that you don't know. You're not looking for something. You you know, you're just tasting what's in the glass. So what do you, do you know a bit of background on what the techniques that they use? The brewery does a lot of different things, um, but they're, they're pretty traditional in most cases. Um, they, they do long barrel aging. They pitch a wide variety of microbes. Um, for some of their beers, uh, the the oat tart is their sort of their big their signature beer, and that one some of it is uh, pitched and some of it just worked racked into clean barrels that had old batches. And the sort of like uh, Sri Kasey at Cambridge Brewing, the microbes in the wood are the ones that do the work, and then they'll blend different ages, younger beer, older beer, to get the right flavor they want. Um, they do a Brewer Weiss Hoffenroth that's one of the better American Brewer Weisses, I think. Um, a lot of, I mean, they're very much a, a fun brewery. They're always trying something. Um, not necessarily weird ingredients, but interesting techniques. They do a 5% sour stout called uh, Tart of Darkness. <laughs> um, and they do all sorts of other things. I mean, both clean and sour. Uh, when they first started, they swore off doing IPA, so now they do a really hoppy lager <laughs> called uh, Humulus Lager, and they have a Humulus series. But it, it, they have lots of fun things. Uh, Patrick Rue, the, the owner, and uh, Tyler King, the head brewer, great guys. So we just had the, and you probably pronounce it better than I, the San Paget. Uh -huh. is, that, is that close? Yeah, <laughs> San Paget. Um, and so it just won a, a bronze medal in sour beer in one of the sour beer categories. I can't keep it straight. Yeah. Could you tell us a little about that beer? Sure. Um, so Saint Spagé is uh, kind of a lighter creek. It's very intense sourness. With uh, we had uh, dried cherries to it about two months before we bottle it. Um, so a nice pink color and intense sourness with a nice uh, nice fruit in the background, with some, some vanilla and a little bit of wood. And why, why dried sour cherries instead of fresh or frozen or concentrate or extract or all the other options that are out there? Um, you know, we like using both pureed, uh, pureed cherries and, um, and dried. I find the dried gives a better color, uh, more tannin. Uh, I don't know, just yeah. drying it out. You have more, uh, I guess, more material per pound going in. So there's a lot of water still in the puree. 
but puree gives a lot of great, a great flavor where these grab you know, really good color, so good flavor too. I know I've heard Vinny from Russian River talk about sour cherry, dried sour cherries and having oil on them. Have you guys found like a supplier? Do you have anything to, to get around that problem? I know every time I've tried to buy dry fruit, it says you know, sprayed with sunflower oil or something to stop them from sticking. Right, yeah, we were able to find, actually, correction, yeah, we use dehydrated cherries. So those are the only ones we could find that didn't have the oils on them. I didn't find the oils to be hugely impactful. We've, I've done use those home brewing, and yeah. it still works, but, you know, the more natural, the better. And so this was, I assume, barrel-aged and brett and wild uh, bacteria and, and the sort of the full range of microbes? Yeah, definitely. Several brett strains, and PDO, lacto, bacillus, so a whole cocktail. And you guys do, like, a clean fermentation before that, or do you do, uh, you know, just everything in the barrels and just pitch everything at the same time? Yeah, all of our sour beers are 100% barrel fermented. So we ferment them in a 132-gallon uh, puncheon, uh, have, fill it up halfway, um, do primary fermentation. We're not, not really usually uh, pitching. We'll pitch our, uh, well, we'll just use the yeast that's already in the barrel to kind of kickstart fermentation. So it's a you know, mix of organisms. We have done clean uh, ferments in, in the past for things like oud tart, but we're finding a better result um, just yeah. doing the barrel fermentation, having the bugs get established from the beginning. Cool. Is there any spice in the beer? Any spices? Nope, no spices in uh, San Jose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was tasting some, some spices in there. I guess that comes from the combination of all the things that are happening. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess. Know, I've, I've, I've used dry cherries in the past. Sometimes it gets a little bit of a cinnamony sort of. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that's from the drying or from the, the oak or. Yeah. It's kind of a yeah, kind of a common flavor yeah. with cherries, sour it, cherries especially. It's per- perfect at this time of year. I mean, it really, really recalls the fall kind of you know, dried cherries and a little spicy and a little richer than some sour beers. Yeah. So nice. Absolutely. What well, delicious stuff! Congratulations. Thank you so much. All right, Michael. I. I'm very, very grateful for you to take uh, taking so much time with us. Oh, of course. Uh, not only tonight, but uh, or this afternoon, but in all the appearances you've been on the show. Yeah. It's such a great pleasure to meet you in person. It's been and, a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm a much sour man today because of you. Yeah, no, this was terrific. And uh, we'd, we'd probably be doing this longer, but I've got an hour left to drink about 27 beers that are left on my list. Uh, <laughs> and this is after I've already been at GABF now for a grand total of about 11 hours. So... <laughs> Well, 20, 2,400 beers, it's hard to pick out the ones you want. Well, get to work. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you very much, James. Well, thanks again to Mike Tonsmeyer for his time and expertise in asking those questions that were better than I would have come up with on my own. <laughs> the extent of Mike's knowledge is very impressive, and I can't wait for his book on brewing American sours to come out. Uh, in the meantime, you can go to themadfermentationist.com to read not only about wild and sour beers, but about cheese and bread and sauerkraut and other fermented foods that Mike's been playing with. Lots more good content from Denver next week. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. And we've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store, too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link, including Angie and Josh, who we met out there in Denver, who apparently, among other things that they have purchased, they're the, they're the ones who bought the, uh, the, uh, the cat uh, hairball pills. So <laughs> we appreciate, greatly appreciate your support, and it was a lot of fun to spend uh, some time with Angie and Josh out there. Uh, our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Russian Criminal Tattoo Encyclopedia, Volume 1, and Splash Proof Super Fast Thermapin Purple Instant Read Thermometer, perfect for barbecue, home, and professional cooking, and home brewing, by the way. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. 
Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site. The next time you feel like Amazon shopping, we greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Home Brewers Association or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com as well. Oh, and by the way, we met uh, Brad Ring and uh, Betsy Parks from uh, the Brew Your Own Magazine out there, too. Uh, Great to meet them in person as well. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.